Hello everyone and welcome to today's masterclass. I'm Ian Turkington. I'm the VP for Architecture and APIs here at TM Forum. And today at this masterclass, we're going to be learning how to apply TM Forum's open digital architecture and open APIs. Um, I'm pleased to say I'm not doing this on my own. I'm joined by a great team and over the next hour, we'll be digging in to this important topic. So let's begin by having a look at the agenda. Um, I'm going to begin with a very short introduction. And after this, um, you can see our speakers have turned on their cameras. We have Emmanuel Ocherry. Um, Emmanuel is the CTE and VP for Standards and Industry Development from Huawei. And Emmanuel will be giving an overview of ODA as a whole. You're very welcome, Emmanuel. Following Emmanuel, we have Milan Bagwat, a principal enterprise architect from BT, um, one of my colleagues when I worked there for many years. And Milan will be taking us through a case study showing how ODA has been used in BT for product modeling. You're welcome, Milan. And finally on the agenda, we have Michelle Boudrias, VP for Architecture and Planning from Videotron. And Michelle will be focusing on TM Forum's Open Digital Architecture and particularly Open APIs and how they have been used in video, I'm sorry, in Videotron. So you're very welcome. And finally, hopefully we will have time um, for some Q&A and discussion and we'll be able to bring questions to the, the speakers and we can go through those in a bit more detail. Before I begin, I want to make you aware of a few things about how today's session will run. Um, we're all getting very used to meeting over Zoom. And, but it's not the same as being face to face. And I think we all have to try um, a little bit harder just to keep things as interactive as possible. It doesn't happen as naturally as it used to. So to do this, we have a chat button and a Q&A button available to you throughout the session. You should see them at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use the chat for any general comments, even just to say hello, let us know where you're um, joining us from, or if you, if a speaker makes a particularly good point and you want to say, yes, I totally agree with that. It's always really good to get that positive feedback as we go along. If you do have any questions for us, um, please ask them using the, the Q&A button. The questions will be monitored by myself and all our speakers throughout as we go along um, and we'll hopefully give you um, answers either as we go along or we'll bring them in the Q&A session at the end. So please, please don't be shy. Um, please post your questions or your chat at any time, it just keeps things interactive. So before I hand over to Emmanuel, I want to tell you a little bit about ODA and explain where ODA sits within TM Forum. One of the four pillars of TM Forum is what we refer to as code and frameworks. This is where we publish our standards, our frameworks, and increasingly our machine readable assets, such as the um, open API specifications and test kits. And it's, in, it's within this code and frameworks area that you'll find the open digital architecture. So, so what is the open digital architecture? In a moment, Emmanuel will tell us much more detail about this, but really at a high level, ODA is a living, breathing architectural blueprint. It's been designed to support our industry as we move into the cloud native era. It provides you a framework to enable CSPs to unlock growth, profitability, and deliver cutting edge customer experience. So I want to finish my introduction with four points about ODA. ODA is supported by over 50 of the world's leading CSPs and vendors. ODA has been created and tested by our industry. ODA is not something that TM Forum have dreamt up in a darkened room. It has been people like you getting together and jointly creating this architecture blueprint. ODA has a support ecosystem wrapped around it. This includes things like documentation and training from TM Forum, but even more than that, it has a complete ecosystem such as systems integrators who have teams who are trained in ODA. They understand the frameworks, the concepts, the language, and they're ready to go. So that ecosystem helps you deliver ODA. And finally, um, ODA has not stopped evolving. It's a living, breathing framework. It is continuously being developed as technology changes and markets change. So that's really all I was wanting to say as a very, very brief summary of ODA. Um, as I say, the first um, speaker we have today is Emmanuel, and Emmanuel is going to be going into um, a bit more detail just to let you know what ODA is before we look at our two case studies. Emmanuel, you're very welcome. Over to you. 
Thanks, Ian. Um, thanks a lot, um, folks. Joining today is, um, is actually a pleasure to share with you um, what we've done over the period um, of, I think, two to three years, and essentially try to, in a very short um, time, compress what ODA is uh, into about just um, four or five slides. Um, you will not get the complete detail, um, even though uh, I understand, you know, um, this, this is supposed to give you some good sort of breath about, you know, what ODA is. Uh, I'm just going to quickly give you, um, in a nutshell, you know, exactly what, 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 what I'm asked to speak about, what ODA is. Um, and I think um, Ian started off with a very key point, you know, that it's an evolving sort of architecture is a living architecture. Um, but I like to look at it as really, you know, the enterprise architecture um, to deliver on the objectives of being open uh, and then equally to be able to um, integrate digital technologies into your, um, into your environment, indeed to, to drive your digital transformation. Uh, and I think the, the reason why I consider it as, as, as an essential enterprise architecture is that, um, you know, it, it basically gives you that blueprint um, to not just look at IT, but indeed how the organization uh, as a, as a, a, in totality operates together uh, in order to fulfill the, the strategy of indeed, you know, um, becoming a digital um, service provider. Uh, and, and so as a blueprint, you know, it, it, it's basically um, pivoting on very two very key points, um, openness, uh, and then of course, digital um, dexterity. Uh, and to do that, we had to go through uh, a series of uh, iterations to try to encapsulate um, some of those key architectural patterns that are common with uh, more digital native uh, um, enterprises. Uh, and then, you know, take those core concepts in, 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 you know, in, in those environments to try to, you know, um, see them into um, the framework for, for ODA. Um, the other key point was that, it, you know, it had to amalgamate um, a lot of the top or indeed the leading uh, enterprise practices for digital transformation. Uh, and so you would see um, in ODA some sort of uh, figment of, you know, concept from TOGAF, um, from PACE, um, indeed from even the old um, SOA, uh, as well as service-based architecture or even event-based um, architecture. Uh, and I think at this point, it's important to, you know, keep at, you know, at the back of our minds, the value of an enterprise architecture. And I think um, Mackenzie's um, recent report um, actually um, provided a very good um, sort of framing, you know, for how enterprises that use, you know, an enterprise architecture are actually able to perform much better, um, both from a business operations point of view, um, and then also from a technology transformation point of view. Um, so indeed, you know, that I think is going to be the bedrock um, of what we do by way of evolving ODA. Uh, and then also to ensure that um, it actually, you know, continues to um, increase or indeed improve on the fundamentals to drive that digital transformation uh, ambition um, within our industry. Um, Erica, would you please um, go to the next slide? So um, a couple of, I've, I've had a couple of folks, you know, um, come to me a bit confused um, about, you know, what exactly ODA is by way of representation. Uh, and, and I think I'm, I'm going to um, show two representations today, both of which are ODA, but both um, provide also different viewpoints. Um, this particular viewpoint, which indeed, you know, gives you the life cycle, um, really tries to, again, from an enterprise architecture point of view, bring in the concept of the fact that you cannot exactly uh, uh, um, drive a technology change without um, a strong um, business um, handshake. Um, and so we, we talk of the, you know, the life cycle as a, a framework for you to understand the business, um, translate the business needs into a set of objects, 
uh, and for those objects we identify in TM Forum, um, a set of business capabilities or what we call the business architecture component, and as well a business process framework. Um, so for a business architecture component, you essentially be talking about the business capabilities, um, value streams, um, you talk about causes of action, um, which all need to work in tandem um, to fulfill the, the mission goals and of course the strategy of the organization. Um, so understanding exactly what the business needs, what the business wants, you know, being able to uh, uh, essentially demarcate the needs um, against the want and, and identify the, 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 the right business capabilities that you need to um, build on or to improve or to transform, then helps you to get into the second um, quadrant. Um, and I think the first quadrant I was speaking about was a business quadrant. Um, the second quadrant gives you a little bit more of the you know, information object that you would manage. Um, so in that case, you know, how do you standardize those information objects in, in a systems architecture um, sort of view? Uh, and in that quadrant, um, we talk a lot about the functional architecture uh, or the functional framework and also the, the architecture. And then equally um, to support that, we also talk about the, uh, the, the, the information framework, which essentially is the shared uh, uh, information data model we've got in the TM forum, which indeed we are also transforming um, as, as digital becomes the, the seed um, focus of strategy um, for service providers. Um, so um, going on to the third quadrant, which is the implementation quadrant, uh, it, it is about how you, know, how you realize um, through reusable technology artifact, some sort of implementation patterns. Uh, and those implementation patterns, you would um, you would see some of them actually uh, um, walked through um, by uh, Melend and then of course by Videotron um, later on in the in the presentation. But in the, in the implementation quadrant, we focus a lot on the technical architecture uh, and components, um, as well as the open APIs. Uh, and then of course behind the open APIs is the TM Forum data model. Uh, and it's really all about, you know, establishing at this, you know, at this particular quadrant, a set of very uh, more low level um, technical ready or what you'd consider machine readable um, frameworks and standards. Uh, and in there, of course, um, if you're familiar with the work um, being done in the TM forum, we've got over 50 um, REST open APIs that are equally being evolved um, to, you know, to meet the needs of, of the industry, um, particularly as technology becomes uh, 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 more viable um, by way of certain use cases. Uh, and then in the fourth quadrant, we've got the deployment and runtime. And the deployment and runtime quadrant actually encapsulates a set of artifacts that equally are essential for you to operationalize um, your, your architecture. Uh, and in there, of course, you've got the operations frameworks. Um, you've also got the, the reference implementation uh, by way of work being done um, to try to uh, um, indeed in, you know, crystallize some of the concept within ODA, some of the standards um, that has been defined um, by way of readable standards into actual um, runtime um, a management environment. Uh, and then, of course, there is a canvas, which is an instance of an environment where you actually deploy um, your reusable um, technology artifact that you've um, actually defined or indeed built uh, in the implementation quadrant. So this life cycle is actually very important for us to um, actually, you know, uh, have a handshake between both the business part of our enterprise, uh, as well as the technology part of our enterprise. Uh, and it also ensures that there's also a handshake between those who build the, 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 the technology and then those who operate um, um, the technology. And, and I think this is very key for us to, you know, um, get, get an understanding of how do you walk through or how, how do I essentially um, bring this into my environment? Um, open digital architecture is not just looking at it from a technology point of view. Uh, the continuum from business through to operations and then back to business 
um, is key for us to have a, as, as a billboard um, for driving our transformation uh, uh, agenda. And of course, um, to, to essentially manage all this, we've got the governance um, piece, which indeed ties all of these together. So how do you govern requirements um, from the business through the information systems uh, architecture uh, um, quadrant through um, implementation to deployment and runtime, and then again back to to the business. So that continuum has to has to be there, and and, and indeed the life cycle view um, is to ensure that you know that clarity of you know understanding the the need to to work with the business um, does not leave uh, a focal uh, uh, um, view. So again, this is really the you know the the, the key anchor point with regards to the, this slide, as showing you the open digital architecture lifecycle. Uh, and again, as I indicated, we, within each of these um, boxes that you find on the screen, um, TM Forum has assets that um, we are essentially continuing to work on, uh, and indeed are available for um, for members to to leverage. Um, but before you know, uh, uh, I leave you uh, that um, Erica, if you could just um, advance to the next slide. Um, the the functional architecture is also one view that um, you know folks have found um, quite interesting, uh, and I, I've got a, a simple rule around the functional architecture, which I call the five four three two one uh, uh, rule, uh, and it, it, it essentially gives you you know from you know an information systems organization. A point of view, uh, it, it, it shifts from the traditional, you know, three stack model that was once um, very, you know, prominent within the industry. You had a BSS, you had an OSS, and then you had a network. Um, but this view is 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 doing a bit more of, uh, you know, um, further modularization um, with very clear bounded context for what exactly each of these function blocks must focus on and what information asset it needs to manage. Um, because in, indeed, in digital, everything is about information anyway. So we've got the engagement uh, uh, management um, block, um, which essentially is supposed to handle all your um, user interactions. Indeed, you know, uh, the, 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 the need for you to handle uh, uh, interactions with people, with organizations, with things. Um, you've got the the party management, which is all about you know how do you manage the 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 essential uh, uh, um, uh, what you can call the organizational object by way of people uh, and then indeed even even partners, uh, and then you've got the bit about the core commerce management, which focuses a lot more on the uh, the commercial uh, um, bit. So again, from uh, procurement through to product, uh, and then of course, to, to, to creating of um, a, a typical uh, a partner engagement. Uh, and then of course, you've got also the production uh, um, layer, which is all about um, the details around um, how you manage your nut and bolt um, that support indeed, you know, productizing uh, uh, capabilities within your, your organization. Uh, and then on the far right of that particular functional architecture, you've got the intelligence management, which um, is not necessarily, you know, uh, um, focusing on um, AI, but it's the, it's the full gamut of what exactly you could do um, to deliver on, you know, um, an intelligent um, sort of engine behind um, your, 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 your operations. Um, so these five functional blocks are actually, you know, uh, uh, enterprise are uh, all you know focused on enterprise concerns, uh, and these enterprise concerns are quite important for us to you know uh, uh, ensure that we we bring that you know thinking into the digital space because quite frankly, um, how we had been doing it you know we with, with the, the typical BSS OSS stack um, was not um, very modular, uh, and that created a lot of um, of friction, especially between BSS OSS and then also between OSS and network. Um, with this sort of uh, um, five function blocks, you get a bit more of flexibility uh, and, then it, and then you're able to also uh, um, compartment, uh, compartmentalize um, a lot of the capabilities that each of these function blocks uh, um, bring to you as an organization. 
And then the, the four is the, the business activity function. So the, the business activity functions really are the party management, the core commerce, the production, and the intelligence management. Uh, and these four uh, um, function blocks actually uh, are where you would find actual enterprise business processes. You would not find business processes in the engagement management. Um, uh, of course, the three stands from um, a systems grouping. So if you're looking at it from a systems grouping point of view, you see the engagement management as the systems of engagement. Um, you see the party management, core commerce, uh, production um, being your systems of records. Uh, and then, of course, you see your intelligence management, which is far right, um, as your systems of insight or indeed your systems of intelligence. So again, you've got three system groupings that you can you can actually um, begin to map into your systems uh, uh, architecture point of view. Uh, and then on the second, uh, or what we call uh, on the two, is the, is the viewpoint. So um, if from a viewport point of view, um, you can have the front end view. Uh, and then, of course, the back end view, where the back end view is, is basically uh, a back end looking at all the four business activity function blocks. Uh, and then the front end view is basically your, um, your engagement management. Uh, and then we've got one um, very you know, interesting, uh, uh, we call it the decoupling and integration. Uh, uh, um, you, I mean, some call it layer, um, but I just prefer to just call it uh, a messaging backbone. Um, that allows you to have each of these function blocks, if you have components in them, to interact directly with each other, which again is a shift from the traditional layered model, where you have to go through a couple of layers before you end up talking to a specific component. In this architecture, a component in the engagement management function can talk directly with a component in the production management. And the same for production to intelligence, or intelligence to call commerce or uh, uh, vice versa. So uh, with, with that giving you um, some sort of you know, clarity around what exactly the functional architecture is, uh, I would also like to introduce you to also the concept of the, um, the component. And I think um, there was already a, a masterclass on, on the component um, piece already. So I'll quickly run through this bit. Um, the component is really a conceptual model of a software or a unit of software uh, uh, asset. Uh, and the idea of you know, having a standardized way to describe that software asset actually helped uh, us you know, come up with this concept of this um, Pentagon, which essentially says that you know, a component must have a core function. Uh, it must be um, equally uh, uh, a have a managed capability. Uh, and in it, indeed, it has to talk to other components or it has to be reporting um, setting, uh, whether it's exposing its capabilities or indeed serving uh, specific information to other components through the notification and reporting uh, um, function. And then equally, it has to have um, a set of security um, attributes that indeed allow us to deploy that component uh, in a safe manner, to manage it in a safe manner, and indeed to operationalize it uh, in a secure uh, manner. And, and for, you know, for all these core functions, they would equally uh, um, be working together on, uh, on what we call the environment. So in an environment where the component is deployed, there are going to be certain dependencies that the, the component, uh, for, for describing that component, you must have. Uh, and so, you know, the Pentagon then represents, uh, gives us a good representation of uh, a set of, you know, specifications that we can have um, to describe this software unit uh, uh, as a deployable um, instance within uh, uh, an environment. Um, but to again, to understand you know, how this component uh, piece works and how uh, it fits into the grand um, picture of uh, ODA, there are a couple of key requirements that you know, um, um, drove this, you know, this, this, this line of thinking or in this, uh, uh, this, this, this line of, uh, uh, of, 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 of um, concept uh, and then principles definition. Uh, and indeed, um, a lot of these, uh, I will not go into, into details, but I think some of them are quite uh, essential for us to highlight. And, and some of those are the fact that, you know, an ODA component must belong to one ODA uh, function block. So um, you cannot have a component that straddles more than one function block, say a component that sits in party management and in core commerce. That would basically break the the logic uh, and, and then the governance around um, the, the ODA 
uh, functional architecture. Um, the other key point here is that components are also supposed to be defined to be intent-based. Uh, now that is an ambition um, that we strive to, uh, uh, um, to arrive at, but it's not exactly there yet uh, as we go through the motions in, in actually identifying these components uh, and then indeed providing the specifications for them. Um, the other key bit about these are that components are supposed to be secure by design. Uh, and then of course, essentially um, inheriting also the concept of privacy um, by design. And, and these 12 key requirements have become the key principles that allow us to essentially evaluate a software asset, you know, to be ready uh, and deployable within an environment based on the, you know, the governance that we've built um, um, behind uh, ODA. So um, with, with regards to the 54321, you know, um, bounded contest, I think that again, to just give you a quick idea of what exactly the functional architecture is and why it is different from the life cycle view, because the functional architecture now begins to provide you the fulcrum um, on which you actually weigh your technology asset into your, you, you know, your, your operational environment. Um, so with that, um, Eric, if you could just um, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, a lot of folks, you know, talk about transforming with, with ODA. Uh, and the transformation with ODA is not, um, well, you can decide to go the greenfield approach, which, which essentially gives you a, a, a big bang. Uh, and equally, you could um, take on the brownfield, you know, uh, approach where you um, do things in an incremental uh, um, um, process. Um, the, the, the clumsy uh, and enclosed uh, environment of our BSS, OSS and network, um, which indeed was what exactly we had in, in the past, uh, must essentially be transformed to the componentized um, agile um, operating environment. Uh, and to do that, you know, the, 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 the proposal here is that you would go through a set of key steps uh, and then those key steps are going to be very key for us to be able to uh, 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 indeed be able to take those assets we have in TM Forum uh, and then build them into um, your own transformation environment. So this proposal here gives you a sort of bird's eye view of how you would go about the, the transformation journey. Uh, and, and so I wouldn't spend too much time on that because I think I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, so again, from, um, from a functional architecture point of view, from the, you know, from the engagement, the decoupling and integration from the party management, core commerce, uh, and the production environment, there are a couple of components that we found uh, that have been defined again um, as part of the work we're doing. Uh, and those components have been, um, have been, you know, have been arrived at or indeed have been uh, identified based on use cases. Uh, a couple of meta models that uh, we've built indeed to uh, essentially evaluate some of these components. Uh, and then also um, from the work that the business capability team is doing by way of providing a definition for a set of um, business capabilities. Uh, and so again, I wouldn't go too much into details, but it gives you a, a sort of better eye view of some of the components we've already defined um, for the functional architecture uh, and how you can you know, map them to your environment indeed uh, uh, um, be able to identify how you transform your existing um, stack into um, this particular um, view. Um, so again, without uh, much uh, um, walkthrough of the details here, I'll just go to the last slide, uh, um, Erica. Okay, so that's over to Melend. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was a very, very clear overview. I'm definitely going to be um, stealing some of those ideas, the 54321. I like that. Um, so, yep, thank you very much. Next up, we have um, Milland. Um, and Milland's going to take us through an example of actually applying ODA in a real situation in BT. So, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ian, and thanks, Emmanuel. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, so, today I'm going to talk in brief. Uh, I only have 10 minutes about the specific use of the ODA information framework uh, in uh, what we call our product modeling scheme uh, that we designed for our brand new IT systems uh, and the benefits that we have seen uh, with this approach. Um, we have presented this approach in a lot more detail at the Global Architecture Forum um, 
on the 17th of June this year. Uh, so, you know, if you want uh, more detail, you can go and uh, uh, see the recording. Uh, we are also, um, along with TM Forum, uh, going to publish a white paper uh, on the same topic uh, very shortly. So um, uh, that will also provide a lot more detail of, you know, how our, our product modeling scheme. So in terms of the history, uh, BT has been uh, contributing to TM Forum uh, since its inception. So we've been using kind of APIs, SID models and TAM in various parts of our organization. Uh, but what we found is that uh, we, have, we were not able to get as much, as much benefit uh, in terms of the agility and the reuse uh, as um, we would have really liked. Um, this was because um, there was not a common approach followed uh, and every team uh, essentially used their own interpretation of the TM forum specifications with uh, limited success. Uh, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, under a new CEO, uh, we embarked on this um, new transformation program uh, to simplify our business as well as to simplify uh, our IT. So this involved building a new uh, architecture using uh, ODA as a reference. So for example, using ODA functions uh, open API and said information models. Um, and this is probably the biggest inv investment BT is making in its digital transformation. So um, certainly the biggest since I joined BT about 15 years ago. Uh, and when we started on this sort of um, uh, transformation, technology transformation in the initial days, uh, what we said was, yo, we are going to use TM Forum. So we pointed the solution design teams and the development teams at the TMF specifications. Uh, and we quickly realized that that was not going to work. So um, TMS specs are vast uh, and really difficult to consume by the masses. And we figured that we had to really, you know, distill all of the TMF knowledge um, uh, uh, into a solution design guide uh, that would be easy for the technical squads to consume. Uh, so a small team of EAs and SAs and dev teams, we got together uh, and we created this solution design guide. Now this guide itself uh, runs into several hundred pages and it covers multiple functional areas. Uh, but today I'm going to focus very specifically on the uh, uh, product modeling scheme. Right. So, next slide, please. So um, these were some of the pain points uh, that we really wanted to address uh, with our product modeling scheme. I think the biggest problem was agility. So we were not able to launch new products and offerings uh, as fast as we wanted to. Um, also any development was expensive, really took a long period of time. And this was because we were not able to reuse uh, the code developed uh, elsewhere. You know, so we were developing the same code over and over again. Uh, and also because of the way our product services and resources were modeled, we were creating a lot of complexity. Uh, we were not able to easily support um, the scenarios uh, that are expected by our CFUs. For example, to do a modify, sometimes we had to seize and provide uh, because of the way the product services and resources uh, were were modeled. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is like a um, uh, summary view of um, uh, our uh, product modeling scheme. Um, and I'm going to start from the leaf product specification uh, right there at the middle, right? So this is the key entity for us, which is this leaf product specification and it is a manifestation of the underlying services um, uh, in the core commerce area. So Emmanuel mentioned core commerce as one of the functional blocks. And so uh, leaf product specification is a manifestation of the underlying services in the core commerce. Uh, and this is really our unit of reuse. Now, initially we thought, you know, how do we decide uh, what, what a leaf product specification is. So what sort of, you know, what, what constitutes a leaf product specification? Uh, what should it, its granularity be? Uh, 
Uh, and so one of the definitions we came up with was that any component that had an impact on the cost or the price or was customer selectable, we would define that as a leaf product specification. And a leaf product specification essentially would be independent in the sense that, you know, we would be able to develop it independently without sort of having to uh, develop some other something else and, and be tested right independently as well uh, so essentially um, we have created a library of these leaf product specifications which i will sort of um, show on the next slide now if you go no sorry um, I, I please stay on the yeah so if you go from the leaf pro product specification of upwards sometimes a group of components are sold together right all the time right so so then what we thought was that we should have this thing called master product specification, which was just a composite of these leaf product specifications in situations where we found that we were selling a bunch of leaf product specifications together. Uh, and then we would bundle these leaf product specifications or these master product specifications into innovative sort of uh, offerings uh, for the um, customer. Uh, so that is the commercial item, the product offering that really sits uh, in the catalog and includes pricing strategies and discounts and things like that. And we expect the maximum change to happen uh, within the product offering layer, because that is where we would be sort of um, creating these offerings from the underlying leaf product specifications but once a leaf product specifications is created, uh, we don't expect it to change that much. Um, now, if you look from the leaf product specification downwards, uh, a leaf product specification can be created from um, one of these three types of uh, underlying services. Uh, so the first thing we could do is that we could buy the leaf product specification um, or the service underpinning the leaf product specification from another supplier. Um, so these are things that we would resell uh, to our customers and we call it supplier product specification, uh, sorry, supplier product or service. Then uh, we could produce, so uh, Emmanuel spoke about the production uh, layer and within BT, we could produce digital uh, customer facing services on our own infrastructure. So on our own network or compute infrastructure, and we call them digital customer facing services. Uh, and then we also offer a number of managed services. So, you know, assurance and non-assurance type services like monitoring, training, project management, et cetera. So um, we created a category called managed services, uh, customer facing service. So managed service CFS. So um, next slide, please. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, this is our catalog of the leaf product specifications. Um, this, uh, organized into uh, different categories um, uh, for those who kind of um, uh, have a background in chemistry, this is our periodic table, essentially, uh, from which we can create a number of uh, elements and compounds. Uh, so how did we come up with this, um, uh, this um, uh, table? So we looked across BT, we thought long and hard about kind of the services that we uh, offer in BT, uh, as well as the capabilities that we have, uh, business capabilities that we have within BT, that could be uh, sort of uh, sold uh, to our customers. Uh, and, 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 and we have come up with this catalog and the customer facing units uh, within BT uh, have to build product offerings using the leaf product spe uh, specification components uh, from this library. So um, uh, this is our Lego set essentially uh, that we offer to the various uh, customer facing units. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are the benefits that we see um, uh, see from, from this sort of approach? And um, 
I've just listed some of the main features. I mean, there are several, you know, uh, but uh, I think uh, I've just listed some of the main features and some of the main benefits that we see uh, from the features. So um, the first thing, as I said, is um, the library of leaf product specifications. It's like a Lego set for us. And that allows customer facing units to rapidly create sort of innovative product offerings uh, for example, we could we could have a component or leaf product specification called security service, right? Uh, and then we could sell that security service on its own, or we could combine it with uh, an assurance managed service where, you know, we are not only selling the security service, but we are also managing the security service uh, for our customer. Um, so the, the, also there is very clear organizational ownership in BT uh, defined for every item in the library. Uh, and, and that organization is also accountable for its costs. So um, we have very cl clear visibility uh, of the organizational ownership as well as the cost of a leaf product specification. And also the automation is built into the leaf product specification. So we can kind of build a leaf product specification once uh, and reuse it uh, across various customer contracts. Now, the second kind of feature is that, um, uh, you know, we have said that supplier products service does not have to use the production layer, right? It just, you know, from core commerce, we place a direct order uh, into the supplier. Now, what's the benefit of that is some parts of BT want to be over the top layers where they combine product and services uh, they buy from suppliers or from ecosystem partners uh, with um, with some digital managed services or or in fact you know sorry from some digital services or managed services uh, for example um, you know zoom uh, we could buy the conferencing service from zoom combine it with bt voice and um, uh, and uh, uh, an assurance managed service uh, and this allows uh, the CFU to do that, um, but also allows low cost consumption uh, of uh, supplier products. Uh, and also uh, because of our clear definition of the supplier pr uh, product service, uh, digital CFSs and a managed service RFSs and assignment of its fulfillment to various um, uh, uh, IT systems within our architecture uh, it has uh, created a clear separation of concerns, right? So uh, there is a team that is uh, responsible for uh, delivery of all of the managed service CFSs. There is a team that is responsible for delivery of the digital um, CFSs uh, and so on and so forth. So there is very clear separation of concern and ownership, uh, as well as there is a cons consistent model for, um, uh, for consumption of uh, of, of those product specifications. Um, yeah, so it doesn't matter, you know, we, what the CFU is, they are building their product offerings from the same underlying um, uh, product specification library. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over uh, uh, back to Ian. Thanks. Milland, thank you very much. That was a, a very good presentation, particularly take it's good to see those benefits at the end and particularly the benefits of having clear responsibility and separation of responsibility. So thank you very much for going through that. Um, our last case study today is from Michelle Bugras. So Michelle is going to be taking a very different view. Um, the previous view with BT was very data centric. This one is very much focused around the, the open APIs. Um, so Michelle, over to you. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, Erica, if you wanted to go to the next slide. So uh, give you a bit of context of what we've done and, and why we ended up with uh, using open APIs. Back in 2019, Videotron wanted to um, start a major digital transformation. And we had a major decision to take at that moment is either go uh, with the legacy system and transform or decide to go a brand new uh, with a brand new BSS and USS platform. And this was triggered by the acquisition of a, a Comcast product that, that covers 
uh, broadband and TV. Uh, Videotron is a quad play player. We do mobility and we do wired lines, but uh, we wanted to focus on transforming the TV and, and the, the next generation of a smart internet uh, inside the home. So uh, I started an enterprise architecture project at the time, which focused on, on four things, people, process, data, and technology. So one thing that we decided at that point also is not just to do uh, regular EA work. It was to base the EA work on um, industry standards. So at the time, ODA was not as rich as it, as it is today. And we wish we had the opportunity at uh, at that moment to have what's available today. So we decided to concentrate on frameworks and open APIs. And that was, that was really the, I mean, the, the game changer for us is to really transform using industry assets in order to uh, do the, I would say, the link between the business and the IT transformation. Since the business was transforming at the moment, we realized that IT and engineering had to transform at the same time in order to support the business objective. Erica, next slide. So, so as, as um, Emmanuel said, we focused on our work on first business capabilities. So uh, at the time in 2019, the, the business uh, capability map for TM Forum was not available. So we built our own. And what we've done is uh, with that uh, that capability map will link the capabilities to ETOM level three processes. And then by doing that, we linked also Videotron systems to ETOM processes. So as we were doing transformation, we were doing the impact analysis on what needs to be changed in order to deliver a specific functionality. We had done also link from ETOM to TAM functions and link that to um, to VL systems also to see at, the, at another granular level is which functional component was being affected by that transformation. And also by doing this, uh, by doing functional framework stuff, then we looked at the, the SID models that were affected by that transformation. And then at the end, we were able to link that to open APIs. So one thing that we've done and we realized is that as, as Ian mentioned about machine uh, readable assets is that in order to do that, you need a tool to, let's say, manage those match machine readable, uh, readable assets. So we use Spark CA in order to reverse engineering the, um, the uh, open API definition into uh, Archimate data objects. So by doing that, we're able to, let's say, uh, link let's say the open APIs we're using to let's say the original version or the standard version of open APIs and also make uh, transformations to those open API based on specific stuff that let's say has to do with only our business. So we were, we were able to do let's say back and forth between what's available today, what has been changed and also create standards that did not exist at the time. So if you look at um, the initial sets of open APIs that are that are REST APIs, there were about 50 at the time, and, and we contributed back 10 open APIs. So as we did that transformation, we realized that in order to, to uh, let's say, provide a leadership into the industry is not just to use what's available, but also invest time and give back to the industry in order to do that. So this allowed us to do with all those links, capabilities to process, process to frameworks, frameworks to data and data to open APIs and doing that mapping. This allowed us as we transform to see all the impacts that were being um, uh, identified and also by linking IT assets to all those uh, frameworks, then it allows us to see, okay, uh, do we need to transform this system? Do we need to integrate to this system? How much uh, change need to happen to this system? And also to work and, and, and go process by process in order to do that transformation. So, so for us, the value in ODA is not just the assets per se, as a standalone stuff, but it's the mapping across all those things that make sense because 
when you do transformation, it just not affects, let's say, one component. It affects multiple components. So that's why that's why we saw the real value into in doing into doing the, the framework stuff. Next page, Erica. So as I said, we we by doing this mapping, we're able to identify which open APIs that were uh, part of our scope of our, of our initial project. So there was uh, 16 of them that were used as is. We made changes to maybe 10 of them. And a part of those 10s that we created, we gave uh, 10 back to the industry and they were uh, they're in the process of being approved. And I confirm with Tiago would see that it's almost finished. So that so that as as we do this, not only we consume what exists today, but we give back to the industry, as we're doing for business capabilities. Also, we're part of that group inside TM from and, and also as part of the mapping guild to link all those things together. But I think the real value into ODA is how how do you use it? How do you you make it actionable into your organization? So that's it, Ian. That's my that's my part. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, well, we have reached um, the time for some Q&A. So um, if everyone can turn their cameras back on, all of the, the speakers, um, we've got uh, about five or 10 minutes here to get some through some Q&A. There's been some Q&A coming along as we have gone. I'll refer back to some of those if we um, need to, but any new questions, now is the time to, to post them um, and we will get through those. So of a I want to go back to Michelle straight away. One thing which came to mind just as you were talking there, um, and I've got a question for you. This didn't come up from the audience. It's just one which was on my mind. Uh, really a question about the benefits. You've been on this journey. You've been bringing in the open APIs. Um, are you actually seeing the benefits of that in your organization? And, and what are the benefits that you're seeing? It's uh, ju just to give you an example is um, our B2B business will require to have multiple BSS to be installed. I mean, there is no way with products to B2B that are too specific. So by using open APIs, we can leverage the integration. We do it once and leverage it multiple BSS. And that makes it a lot easier. One thing I didn't mention, I'm sure you're gonna ask me, yeah, you're gonna ask me that question is, there was a culture transformation uh, or say uh, uh, a brainwash that needs to be done in order to use open APIs. And, and I'll give you an example is we brought Pierre Gauthier for one session internally, because I mean, it's easy to do the, the things the same old way, but if you want to go to open APIs, you need to have culture transformation and, and culture shock. So Pierre came in and in about three days, he, he transformed the way we looked at how we would integrate with this new project. And then, really demonstrated the benefits of open APIs and why it's a good thing to go down that path for not just the short, medium, but also for the long term. So Pierre was really a, an enabler in order to do that transformation because, I mean, we do technology every day, we're really good at it, but sometimes you need a shock to transform and, and move to a different path. And that's what Pierre has done for us. Yeah, and, and has the culture changed? Has, has it oh yes, uh, yes, and 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 for the better because now I'll give you an example. We were mostly an SOA based type of integration. Now we're we're doing REST microservices, but mm -hmm. just by leveraging what's inside the open APIs that made that transformation possible. Yeah, I'm wanting to 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 pick up on that um, culture change and, and and changing people. I think that's very tricky. Um, one of the things um, you talked about, Milland, was the sort of the, the separation of responsibilities and the accountabilities and, and different bits of the organization being responsible for different bits of the, the model. Um, how are you, what's your observation? How is that working? Are, are people accepting that or is it still work in progress? Um, I think it is a uh, work in progress. I mean, we have, uh, we have moved um, quite a lot from where we were. Um, so um, uh, when we started this journey uh, and we, we did include a number of uh, solution architects and developers um, along with us, uh, and, and, but, but I mean, there were massive uh, disagreements and debates for the first several weeks. Uh, and um, what we then decided to do was we decided to document the agreement. So these, these are the things that we agree. These are the things that we don't agree with. 
uh, and then we decided to try it out you know because many times we, we, you could spend weeks just debating things but I, essentially we decided to try things out so we um, we tried the product modeling team on different types of products so we tried it on cpe uh, on a um, uh, on a connectivity type product and a um, uh, and a unified comms so you know a, a supplier uh, bought product uh, and uh, based on that learnings there was a lot of learning that um, uh, that was achieved from that exercise and then we we build that learning into the next version of our product modeling scheme so i think it needs to be iterative and and essentially you need to try things out and then you know take the learnings from that trial into back into you know uh, whatever you are doing i think that iterative model works much better than just discussion yeah. yes you you almost need to prove it to people and yeah, then once yeah. they see it working they, yeah. they, they sort of get that yeah um yeah. Emmanuel, if we bring you in with one of the questions here, I'm not sure if it's an area you know or not, but I'll give it a go anyway from Benjamin. Um, the, the current coverage of IoT specific um, open APIs or ODA as a whole. So what, what's your view of how um, ODA and APIs are tackling that area? Yeah, I think there is already um, an advanced piece of work by the OpenAPI team um, to create a suite of um, IoT um, um, APIs. Um, so I know that um, there is a bit of work in that area, um, which I think um, is being led or heavily involved in by the, I think it's, the, it's a couple of um, CSPs from um, Asia um, who are actually very um, passionate about this this problem space? You know, having different uh, IoT terminals that you'd have to essentially manage independently, uh, and are trying to actually you know bring all these together in order to have just a simple uh, uh, API that allows you to manage um, these um, these couple of things. So I, I know there is uh, already an advanced um, piece of work in that area. Um, to build a suite of APIs for 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 IoT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, work very much. Yeah, that's uh, my understanding as well. Sort of, still very much work in progress. I'm yeah. just constant conscious of time here. We'll try to get through a few of these questions very very quickly. Uh, Michelle, you'd collect it. You'd like to answer that one about legacy systems within yes. Videotron. Yes, we we align all our legacy systems that are part of the ecosystem of that uh, Elix project to the open API. So I'll give you an example. All the, um, the work management stuff, like uh, when you send the technicians home to install, the legacy system uh, was transformed to use the same open APIs that uh, let's say the BSS system was using. So all across the, the process is being aligned to, to leverage the open APIs with let's say an open API gateway and, um, and also all the transformation being done into a, let's say a, uh, an integration uh, tool to, in order to do that. So all the, the, the legacy system as part of the ecosystem was changed in order to leverage the open API. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's I another question add, here. Yeah, sorry. go ahead, Milland. Uh, I, uh, the, the other angle to this, I mean, within BT, what we found is that it's not always beneficial to build an open API on top of a legacy system because you know the amount of effort required because i mean these legacy systems have their own uh, data models right and to convert those data models into tmf could sometimes be such a massive amount of effort that you know so i think there needs to be enough benefit to justify uh, building a tmf open api on top of a legacy system similar we took a different approach we didn't change the legacy data models we just transform to adhere to the the data mapping between open apis and the legacy system so we didn't have to change a data model we changed at the integration layer not at the uh, database layer so this way we were able to leverage uh, open api so i'll give you an example an sap system that does logistics in the back it will be still an sap system but the process with the open APIs being to do the mapping from TMF to SAP was pretty straightforward in order to do that. So we were able to leverage really fast open API systems uh, to, to legacy systems also. Okay, thank you. I, I, believe it or not, we are out of time. It, we're just getting to this point in the chat where I think this could go on for another half hour and it'd be really informative, but we told everybody it's going to be an hour. So we're going to have to let them go. 
Um, so just of all, I want to thank Emmanuel, Milland and Michelle for your time. It has been really, really useful and really informative. And of course, Erica and Katrin behind the scenes. And, and thank you to the audience for the, the contribution and the interaction the whole way through. If you do want to continue the conversation and find out more, um, you can message any of us directly using the DTWS conference platform. Quite happy to take a message from you and I can, uh, I can respond to those things as well. And I'm sure all of our speakers will be happy with that too. Um, the session is available on replay and the slides will be available. It usually takes about 24 hours for that to be available. But if you go back on the agenda to a prior event, you'll be able to see the replay and the slides. So we have run out of time. Um, thank you all very much for your contribution and for watching today. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye.